Um, firstly, let me echo uh, Sam and Andrew's comments. I am very bullish. I think there's a lot going on in societies and in businesses and in politics and community groups and in advocacy groups that we should be very confident about. I think sustainability and in particular climate change are easily addressed and will be addressed. And as Paul Gilding, whom Sam mentioned earlier, a great friend of hers and of mine, always says, we may be slow, but we're not stupid. We, we will get there. So I think it's a very optimistic time uh, in, um, in sustainability. One of the great questions, I will answer the question, Maria, I just go in a roundabout manner. One of the comments on the floor a minute ago was, why only on climate change? Why not focus on other pollutants and other issues? And I'd like to link the two together because my business and I come at it very much from a carbon perspective. But sustainability, in essence, is about recognizing that um, pursuing unlimited growth, economic or social or wealth growth, in a finite world is a pretty dumb plan. And I just argue that the most pressing and most urgent manifestation of our lack of focus on sustainability is climate change. It'll bite us in the bum more quickly and more painfully than most other elements, but it's not the only element. I certainly agree with you there. Sustainability is a much more a broad church than purely climate change, but climate change is fairly important. Um, to answer the question specifically, what Climate Friendly does, we in effect mobilize investment into carbon projects so we can realize the benefits those projects bring, which are both carbon uh, benefits in terms of clean energy or energy efficiency or, or um, land use and agriculture where you sequester carbon, but more importantly and more increasingly non-carbon benefits, health improvements, infrastructure, welfare, equal opportunity for uh, genders and races, uh, skills transfer, knowledge transfer. And we do that, we mobilize that capital by effectively selling carbon credits from those projects, both to mum and dad um, buyers who buy five tons to offset their trip to the UK and back, or companies who invest millions of dollars directly owning a project in all its glory from start to finish. And the issues that those companies face and their sustainability issues are linked very closely to the climate issues around carbon, uh, uh, climate change issues around carbon because the two go hand in glove. There's an evolution underway and we're by no means at the end game, but it is a process and there are three or four phases we identify both in climate and in sustainability, which are very common. And companies' response to those issues is very common. The first stage, of course, is the dinosaur, the companies and people who do nothing. And the great news is that evolution will bite them and get them in the end because if you are a dinosaur, if you're tramping through the swamp of communities and, and natural systems, bellowing to your friends in the swamp and ignoring the costs of what you're doing, people will stop buying your products and services. You'll either be too expensive compared to your nimble-footed, flexible competitors, or people will simply be so aghast at the cost of what you're doing and the dumb way you're doing things, you'll be out of business. The only issue there for dinosaurs is how much damage they do before evolution catches up and they're wiped out. And uh, hopefully as we move more quickly and as we evolve as a, as a community and as a society, um, those risks of damage will be limited. The second phase of companies, and we see a lot of companies who do tick the box sustainability and then tick the box carbon management. That's about, well, we'll write some nice reports, we'll take some good pictures, we'll talk about things we've measured. Surely that's enough. And in the carbon sense, what that leads them to do is we'll go and buy very cheap offsets that have no real co-benefits beyond simply reducing carbon. That is not to be underestimated. It's a good thing. Pardon me. But at the lowest possible price. We don't really care. We've now got a public target to be carbon neutral, and that's what we'll do. The third wave where many progressive companies are at, both in sustainability and carbon, is what we call in inputs, outputs, and impacts. We know that carbon finance now is a vehicle to achieve extraordinary things in our communities. We understand as a business that if we can operate in the communities or where, we, where we manufacture or distribute our products and benefit those communities, that's a benefit to our business. But that's still seen very much as a nod in the philanthropic direction or as a, um, a donation of charitable funding from your marketing budget or your PR budget. But again, it's a, it's a much more progressive and in many ways aggressive stance than companies who are at the earlier two stages. And that's great, and many companies are there. The fourth stage of evolution, the holy grail, and only a few very progressive businesses are getting into that state, are the companies who say, look, actually, we should internalize this. It's not discretion we spend. This is integrated investment. The business logic of creating value with our communities and our stakeholders in a way that we share is inescapable. It's not about philanthropy, it's not about um, charitable donations, it's about changing the way we do business, because businesses, unlike any other organization on the planet, governments and NGOs in particular, are the most powerful force we have to, to impact and, and execute change. Because they look at things in terms of value, and value is defined as benefits take away costs. And not many of them do it very well, but if you internalize the costs, as Sam said many times, and you look at the ways to generate more value, you can create enormous change. Because companies have got us to where we are, by and large. Companies can get us out of where we are to where we need to be. 
And you can reduce your costs by working your supply chain. You can make them more efficient. You can work with your communities and you can invest in better manufacturing, less transportation, have a much tighter integration of your supply components up and down your supply chain. You, you reduce your input costs, you use less energy, you use less raw materials, you use less water. These are all quantifiable benefits for a company. You can work with your employees. You can make better provisions for health and training and education. You have lost, less lost time through injury and through ill health. You work with communities who buy your products, engage them in making your products more efficient and more effective. So they're the four phases of evolution. And the issue most companies have is how do I go from the second to the third phase? The issue we want companies to have is how do I get to the fourth phase? People who internalize this and say this is a core part of doing business. Once we get there, we will drive enormous change and do it in a way that adds value, real value for us, not the partial value of GDP measures and externalities as economists say, which are just dumb ways of measuring things. Do it smartly, businesses can, can affect enormous change. It's very varied. You, you get both large and small. The larger companies have benefits of scale. They can have a greater impact on costs and benefits. They can impact the supply chain and customers more convincingly because they're big. Small companies have less influence and less leverage, and they're usually part of a supply chain, not controlling the supply chain. But the issues, I think, and the trends are the same. Companies with, with whom we work, uh, the co-op in Switzerland, for example, they're really a, a stage four evolved business. Um, they, bizarrely enough, import roses to sell in Swiss supermarkets from Kenya. Even though they're grown across the border in the Netherlands uh, much more um, cost effectively, the cops say by the amount of energy that is used to keep these flowers in the Netherlands warm, heating and light, is hugely carbon intensive. It's cheaper environmentally to fly them in from Kenya, which is bizarre. But to overcome that perception, they've said, we will now work in Kenya where these roses are grown, particularly with the Maasai tribesmen who do a lot of work in these uh, um, plantations for growing roses, and we'll put in place clean energy, in this case cookstove projects, in their supply chain. The benefits are they generate their own offsets to reduce their overall emissions. They engage with their workers and their supply chain components and make them healthier because indoor air pollution in Maasai huts is the big, uh, indoor air pollution in Africa is the biggest source of death. It, it's worse than malaria and bad water. And the clean cooks, they reduces it like that overnight by 50% or more. You also free up most of the people in who are gathering firewood to have more time spent engaging in activities with their family or with, for employment benefits. And finally, you make yourself a supplier of choice because your costs go down because you're more productive in your supply chain. So that's a really good example of a complete end-to-end -end solution that gives you all the benefits of reducing your emissions at source, generating offsets to reduce those you can't, um, to offset those you can't reduce, but engaging with your customers and with your uh, suppliers in a way that makes sense for all the communities. You get more value for the suppliers, more value for your customers, and more value for the people working in those conditions in Kenya. So I think there are certainly stage four evolved companies out there, and we just need to get more of them.